Are Christians required to love their enemies? I'm going to answer that very quickly for you, and the answer is no. There's not one verse of Scripture in the entire New Testament that's written to a Christian that says that you are to love your enemy. All right, now if you want to see the people that can't endorse sound doctrine, they will be down in the comments section saying that Brian Denlinger, you're dumb, you're stupid. Here's a verse, here's a verse, here's a verse. We're going to go to the verses, okay? And we're going to see when they were written, the context in which they appear, and who they're written to. All right, it's very important that you understand the scriptures completely. This is not a channel for baby Christians or whatever else. This is a channel that gives out meat doctrine. Uh, doctrine that is not found in most church buildings. And I don't say that out of pride. I just simply say that because it's the truth. I've been to church buildings. I was raised in church buildings. I've gone to a lot of different ones throughout my life. But I'm going to show you that there is application for loving your enemy, certainly. But never is a, do the scriptures say to a Christian, remember the key word there, that you are to love your enemies. All right, there's this whole pacifistic movement and everything else that you are to love enemies and, and do all this good stuff for them and everything. Let's see what the scriptures actually say. Let's go to the Bible and drop all your preconceived notions and say, okay, what do the scriptures teach? This isn't the doctrine of Brian Denlinger. This is the doctrine of the scriptures. All right, let's start out in Matthew chapter 5. This is where most people will go. They'll say right, right here, Matthew chapter 5. That's where it says to love your enemies. Let's look about that. Matthew chapter 5 will begin in verse 43 and read down to verse 48. <clears throat> Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh, maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Okay? Now I need to make a, a couple of points here. Point number one. Verse 48 says, Be therefore perfect. Wouldn't that be work salvation? Hmm. Yes, it would be. There's a reason for that. We'll get back to that here in a minute. Um, Matthew chapter 5, point number 2 I don't need to make. Um, where is Matthew chapter 5 located? You say it's in the New Testament. Technically, it's in a, number, in a, a bunch of books called the New Testament, but doctrinally, it's in the Old Testament. Testament. Many people don't realize that. I've talked to you know older people and things at uh, Baptist churches. I remember there was years ago I was going to a Baptist church and there was an older man there, a deacon and everything, and brought up the whole thing of when did the New Testament start? And he just was blown away. I never saw that. And if you want to find out, it's Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15 through 17. The New Testament starts with the death of the testator. What's going on here? The reason that there's they're doing uh, animal sacrifices and they're under the law and things, it's because it's in the Old Testament. And many people don't realize that. So they rip it out of context and they say, well, it's Jesus speaking. Jesus brought in the New Testament, so therefore it's New Testament. No, it's not. Doctrinally, the Sermon on the Mount is in the Old Testament. He's speaking to Jews. All right. Um, it's doctrine for the Millennial Kingdom. All right. Um, how do you know that? Go up to verse uh, 34, Matthew chapter uh, 5, verse 34 and 35 says, But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Is Jerusalem the city of the great king right now? No, <laughs> far from it. Uh, no, Jerusalem is not the city of the great king. And the earth being his footstool, um, that prophecy is about the thousand-year kingdom that's coming. This is all future application, way out into the future, after the time of Jacob's trouble. The church age ends, or the body of Christ age, or whatever you want to call it, because there's church just means called out assembly. It's not anything special for the body of Christ, but it describes what we're supposed to do. We're going to be called out from the lost world. You don't build church buildings, invite lost, and save to it. Another issue. But the church 
after the, or say it this way, the body of Christ, after that time ends with the catching up of the body of Christ, the resurrection, um, what happens, it's not the first resurrection, that's another whole issue. I've uh, done big studies on this whole thing. A lot of people just come along, they see a new video, and they, they don't understand all the many hours of research that go into these studies and the many years that I've been preaching and getting these things ironed out and showing people what the Bible actually teaches. Um, but the body of Christ time that we are in, where the body of Christ is physically on the earth, I'm part of it, hopefully you're part of it, and we're here on the earth, we have work to do for the Lord, when that time when the, the Lord says, okay, the time is up, the body of Christ is taken up. Now, there's no scripture saying that it, immediately after we get called up, the Antichrist is released. It doesn't say that. There's no, you know, when John goes up in, in Revelation chapter 4, and the Antichrist is unleashed in Revelation chapter 6, that doesn't mean that there's, you can kind of gauge how much time is between the two. It's kind of an instant thing or whatever. It could be a while. We have no idea. Um, I mean, you can make the assumption that when the body of Christ is gone, the Antichrist, you know, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Um, you can kind of assume that it's going to be pretty quick. Body of Christ goes up, Antichrist is revealed. And again, don't insult me with foolish comments. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, I do. I've proved all these things for, for many years with my sermons. All right, you can watch them, study them. Don't post stupid comments until you've done that, please, because I've already answered those comments. I've already answered the attacks on what many call the pre-trib rapture. It's not actually the biblical term for it. I have to say all this stuff because, I, like I said, I get this all the time from people. But the body of Christ gets caught up. The time of Antichrist is revealed. The time of Jacob's trouble gets started when he confirms the covenant. All right, Gets started. Seven years it goes. At the end of that, second coming of Jesus Christ, he comes down with us. His saints behind him Marriage Supper of the Lamb, well, first Judgment of the Nations, and then Marriage Supper of the Lamb, and then the Thousand-Year Kingdom gets started, and this is what is preached at that point in time, right? Uh, it's very un important to understand that. But the fourth point that I want to make here in terms of uh, this whole thing of loving your enemies, I want you to think about this. Um, Satan is bound in the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. Again, do the study. I've I put out all the studies going through all these things in great detail. But he's bound and put in the bottomless pit for that thousand-year kingdom. He's released at the end of it to go out and, you know, mess with the nations again. But um, I think it'd be a lot easier to love your enemies when Satan is not there to tempt your enemies. Okay? You can't really love your enemies right now in the, in the true sense of what's going on here in Matthew chapter 5. Because in the future, Satan's bound. See, it's a completely different setup. Um, so, again, can you love your enemies? Well, in a sense, you know, and we'll, we'll get to it here as we continue through the study, but be careful which words you choose. That's the whole thing. Your speech should be seasoned with salt. It should be with, you know, with grace and things. You should, you should have your speech in line with the scriptures and not just repeat things. You know, well, well the Bible says we're supposed to love our enemies it doesn't say that in any of the Pauline epistles, the things that are written to Christians in the body of Christ, the time of the body of Christ. It does not say that. There's nowhere in the Pauline epistles where it says, love your enemies. It doesn't say it. Again, do the research yourself. Please, people, listen to me. Brian Denlinger is a heretic. Brian Denlinger is a, a nut. Brian Denlinger is a cult leader. Brian Denlinger is all this stuff. But yet, there's one thing that these people that accuse me all the time, there's one thing that they always lie about, and that is that I'm coming up with this stuff. I'm not coming up with this stuff. If you want to prove me wrong, it's not about my words or what. What does the Bible say? That's the issue here. I make a book about the Godhead doctrine. You say, oh, it's your doctrine. No, it's not. This has the scriptures in it. I go through the scriptures, show you this verse says this, this verse says that. That's why the Trinity is not true. I go through it. I'm not a modalist. I'm not a oneness Pentecostal. I'm not a Trinitarian. I believe what the Bible teaches. God. There's the Godhead doctrine. Okay? Very important to understand that. So if you hear me say, the Bible does not say to a Christian, Christians are part of the body of Christ. Obviously, we make up the body of Christ. 
The Bible never says to a member of the body of Christ, love your enemies. Those words, it never says it. You say, I find that hard to believe. My pastor says that you're a nut. Okay, then look it up. Look it up for yourself. Prove it. All right, search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. That's how this thing works. Let's go to Luke chapter 6. We'll see another reference here. Luke chapter 6. I mean, you know, you have to remember, you say, what about this thing of perfect, you know, the works-based salvation thing? Let me cover that just for a second here. Um, again, all the, you know, the gospel's always been the same. It's, we're saved by grace. It's saved by grace through faith. Uh, no, that's not true. That's another one of the lies that you'll hear that people say. The gospel's always the same. From Genesis to Revelation, the gospel's always the same. Really? How can you be saved by faith when Jesus Christ is physically present on the earth? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, here, hold on a second. Wait, here he comes. Yeah, he's right there. Marching through the streets of Jerusalem. Hi, hi. Where's Jesus at today? Oh, he's in the he's on this throne there in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. I have to believe by faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Oh, wait, no, actually, I, I can see him. So maybe they're not actually justified by grace through faith at that point in time. Grace is always there. Don't get me wrong. God has to have grace to save anybody, certainly. But faith? No. Faith is not always part of salvation. And in the thousand-year kingdom, where Jesus Christ is physically on the earth, faith does not have anything to do with your salvation. It doesn't. Okay? Because Jesus Christ is physically on the earth, and we, his saints, are there ruling and reigning with him over all the earth, and the devil's bound in the bottomless pit. It's going to be a completely different situation. And that's why you have to love your enemies. I'm going to show you something else very interesting in this passage. Luke chapter 6, verse 27. What strange new doctrine is this? Stedlinger's a heretic. <laughs> Just read your Bible. You'll see I'm right. You'll see the Bible's right, not that I'm right. Luke chapter 6, verse 27. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. Now let me just stop there for a minute. You know, the Bible says about all Scripture being, in, in, you know, is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Now is there instruction and in righteousness in us loving our enemies today? Can you say that as far as instruction and in righteousness? Well, obviously, we'll see that here in a little bit when we get into the Pauline epistles. But what I'm saying is, you can't say, the Bible says, I am to love my enemies, in those exact words, because it's written to people in the thousand-year kingdom. But let's get back to it. Verse 29, And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy uh, coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. Hmm. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. You ever hear the golden rule? Do unto others as ye would have them do unto you. Uh, well, that's actually for the thousand-year kingdom. Hmm. Be careful what you listen to out there. Um, verse 32. Okay. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners and re to receive as much again. <laughs> sinners lending money. <laughs> yeah, little kick to the uh, current uh, Jewish uh, bankers there. Slightly. Um, <clears throat> uh Verse 35, but love, love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Interesting, over in Matthew it says, be perfect, as your Father is perfect. Here it says, be merciful, as your Father is merciful. Very interesting there. But um, I just kind of think it's funny because if you know anything at all about the the favorite profession of most Jews today, um, 
is they like they like to get into the whole finance thing and whatever else. Of course, the most famous financial Jewish family is would be the Rothschilds. And uh, <clears throat> can you imagine the Rothschilds understanding this thing? I mean, you really want to know why the uh, the Jews uh, reject Jesus Christ? They reject this kingdom that he's bringing in. They're saying, we'll bring in our own kingdom. We'll make this whole world a Jewish utopia or whatever. And there's, I mean, I'm not joking. That's what they actually believe. There's, there's a book, I think, called The Jewish Utopia. And um, we're going to bring it in through the banking and system. You know, I don't, I don't care who, who makes the laws. You know, give me the purse strings of the country and I'll control the country. I think it was, you know, Meyer Elmshel Bauer that said that, you know, the founder of the Rothschild family changed his name to Meyer Rothschild. But anyhow, you know, can you imagine this? Hey, Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to bring in a kingdom that not only can you not charge usury, but if somebody comes up to you and they ask you for something, you're supposed to give it to them without hoping to receive it back. We're not talking, like I said, it's not a matter of, well, you can lend or you're just not, not allowed to charge usury. No, it's you're supposed to lend and not even get paid back. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not so good. If you love uh, money and your God is mammon, Ephesians chapter 4. Go here real quick. A little sideline here that I need to kick a few things. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Give you some more reasons why a lot of the Jews out there reject the New Testament. Ephesians 4, 28 says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. So again, you see instruction in righteousness. It's not just ignore everything that Jesus said because we're in the Pauline epistles. No, you're to consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, writes the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6. But you compare Scripture with Scripture, you see. The concept of there being don't charge usury, don't rip people off and things like that. That's there. So again, you have these Jews in, in the first century and the whole way through up till today, and they're looking at this and they're saying, are you kidding me? I can't charge usury? Uh, let him labor with, or let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. I have to just give things away? Mm-hmm. Kind of rough for you if you're a money-worshipping uh, Jewish financier. And of course, you know, they're not all that way. Not, not all Jews are evil or something. They're not all involved in financier type of stuff. But there's a lot that are. And unfortunately, it's, it's uh, given the rest of the Jews out there a really bad name. You know, the name, the word Jew to a lot of people, especially those that get into replacement theology and Holocaust denial and all the other stuff. Um, a lot of them, they just think of it as Jew, meaning those who want to take my money and rob from me. But uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30 through 34, let's read that. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Who's the his people? What's the name of the book that we're reading in here? Oh, that's right. Hebrews. Huh. I wonder if it's written to Hebrews. <laughs> yes. Again, dispensational here, people. You have to rightly divide the word of, of truth. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says that there's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're all one in Christ Jesus. All right? Shortening the, you know, what it all it says there, but it's neither Jew nor Gentile. If you're saved, you're a Christian. I'm a, I'm a Gentile. I'm a Christian. You're a Jew out there. You're a Christian. Okay? But here you have a book written to Hebrews. Why would it be written to Hebrews? Uh, probably because this book and some of the other books here, Hebrews and James especially, are written to a Jew that goes into the time of Jacob's trouble. We'll see about this. Verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Uh, is it a fearful thing right now? Not really. What's it going to be like, though, in the time of Jacob's trouble? Men's hearts failing them for fear. Huh. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A lot of these Jews, they rejected Jesus Christ. They say, oh, he's not our Messiah. Uh, well, you'll, you'll see when the uh, revelation of Jesus Christ comes to pass. Tie it all together here. Verse 32. 
but call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great uh, fight of afflictions. Oh, it says illuminated. Yeah, that's why the uh, Jesuits with uh, Adam Vesopt, they stole it from the Bible, made the Illuminati. Right? It doesn't mean that this is a somehow secret Illuminati writing in your King James Bible. No, <laughs> it's, this is a good thing here. God illuminates you when he saves you. He helps you to understand things. He reveals them to you by his Holy Spirit. When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. That's how it works. And the devil tries to counterfeit it through Freemasonry and the Illuminati and whatever other satanic organizations are out there. Again, the Jews, they see what Jesus Christ is bringing, and they say, we don't want Jesus, we're going to bring it in ourselves. So we don't want the Holy Spirit illumination, we're going to make our own illumination. We don't want the thousand-year kingdom of Jesus Christ, we'll make our own kingdom. We don't want the riches that you're given at the judgment seat of Christ. No, no, we'll make our riches here on the earth. We'll steal from other people. But look at verse 33. Partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them um, that were so used. Uh, for ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven uh, a better and an enduring substance. Very interesting, because if you study Matthew chapter 24, it talks about, you know, if when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, you know that you're to flee into the mountains. Get out of there. Leave. Well, guess what happens to their goods? All their wealth that they've accumulated and everything else. Uh, it's going to be spoiled. People are going to take it. But if you want to be saved, in the time of Jacob's trouble, you have to endure to the end to be saved. Hmm. Interesting. So um, let's next go to Romans chapter 12. As you're turning there, I just I have to ask again. You know, I've said this in different studies, you know. Um, people, I'm, I'm a Jew. We're the true Jews. And think, are you really sure you want to be a Jewish, you know, person? <laughs> uh, if you're not Jewish, you want to go around and start saying uh, Sabbath. We keep the Sabbath and Shabbat and all this other is start, you know, saying Yeshua and all. Do you realize the group that you're trying to get into there? Do you realize how much bad stuff is going to be coming to those people in the future? Yeah, people come to me, they say, you Jewish? No, <laughs> no, I'm not. No, thank you. No, uh, if you're a saved Jew, well, praise Lord for you. I love you in the Lord. That's great. It's great that you've received Jesus as your Messiah. It's a smart thing to do. Um, I'm sure you go through some pretty rough stuff with your family. But, um, hey, praise Lord. But me? No. No drop of Jewish blood in me. I proved it through the you know genealogy type of stuff and whatever else. My sister, older sister, got a DNA test. No Jewish blood. Okay, so I'm not adopted. Um, <laughs> but uh, these people out there, oh, you know, we're Jewish. We're the Jews. We're the true Jews and everything. Yeah. Romans chapter 12. Let's look about this thing of should a Christian love their enemies? Well, the words love your enemies, not there, but... Let's see the concepts here in Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Hmm. Cleave to that which is good. You know, when we see all this wicked stuff out there in the world, we should abhor it. We shouldn't seek to make dialogue with people and whatever else. I saw something this morning was getting the computer going and everything else to, you know, get ready for this study. And I saw this uh, Hindu guy or whatever, it's running for Republican presidential candidate and whatever, and he was asked at some, he was in Iowa, and he was asked by this guy who's an atheist, and then later said, oh, I'm an atheist and a Satanist, you know. How does that work? I have no idea. But, you know, and um, are you against, you know, Christian nationalism and all this st other stuff, and how would you you respond to somebody like me, and what do, what do uh, you have for someone like me? And I thought, how would I have answered that if I was running for president? Yeah, right. But if I was running for president, how would I have answered that? I'd say, I have nothing for you other than the fact that you're a sinner and you need to repent of your wickedness and your sin because if you don't, you're going to burn in hell for all of eternity. I have no common ground. I have no dialogue with somebody that worships Satan, somebody that wants to get rid of someone like me, a Christian nationalist. 
um, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. You want to get rid of me. You see me as a great evil. What evil have I done? Uh, and well, in their little warped little minds, I've done all kinds of evil and whatever else. Uh, there's no dialogue here. I abhor that which is evil, and I cleave to that which is good. Verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Is it written about saved people or lost people? It's written about saved people. It doesn't say to love your enemies, the people out there in the world. It doesn't say that. Brotherly love. Verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Distributing, distributing to the necessity of saints. Saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. So they're similar to what's going on in the Sermon on the Mount. Certainly. Bless them which curse, persecute you, and uh, curse not. Yeah, that's good. It's good advice. You can't live in this uh, real kind of a bitter, angry thing all the time, and anybody you know says anything bad about you, just you know, go after them. You know, God will take care of it. Would rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Talking about saved people again. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Should you try to live peaceably with your enemies? Yeah, try to. But, you know, again, uh, what our founding fathers formed here in America, the thing of freedom of religion, it doesn't mean that you can be have a religious practice or whatever else that wants to kill other people and do all kinds of evil things. No, that shouldn't be tolerated. Right? Um, there's a lot of things that are, are passing under the radar here of uh, freedom of religion. Oh, we can burn cities down because we don't like what happened or whatever else, and we have a freedom. It's a freedom of speech. or whatever. That's not freedom of speech. All right, that's terrorism. Bible-believing Christians aren't going around burning cities down. All right, we don't go and say we're going to just go um, force children, you know, to for forcibly convert children or something like that at public libraries, uh, like the perverts are doing. It's a big difference there, um, and the time is coming where we won't be able to live peaceably with all men. Again, that's, I mean, it's already here in terms of words and things, but um, it'll eventually go to fighting. And it will. It's just the way that it is. Verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. That's not always easy, <laughs> remembering that. Um, but the Lord takes care of stuff. I've seen it. I've seen that there have been people that have wronged me terribly, and I think... I'd really like to just, you know, <laughs> and the Lord's just, you know, just go back to work, go do some things for me, and I'll take care of it. And he has. I actually heard that the uh, catalytic converter thief that uh, stole a catalytic converter off of our property, one of our vehicles, and then attempted to do it to my plow truck, um, actually heard that the ring of thieves that the police were looking for, they finally caught them. I'm talking to a guy at a gun shop, and he told me that. So the Lord took care of it. I didn't have to. The Lord fights my battles for me. Verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So, you know, uh, one of the things that we're supposed to do as Christians is we're supposed to be kind to evil people as a way to actually get them infuriated. A little bit of a sarcastic thing that we're doing, in other words. So... An interesting way to look at that. But um, Romans chapter 13, let's go there. Verse 7. Romans 13, verse 7. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, wait, I thought we, what about thou shalt, or you know, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Oh, yeah, it's not, that's not there. Sorry to all the uh, Seventh-day Adventist nuts that are following a devil-possessed woman that 
told them not to eat meat. Um, yeah, I'd get out of that cult. But uh, there's no scripture saying that we have to keep the Sabbath day, okay, as a Christian today. Again, you need to rightly divide the word of truth. But uh, if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Hmm. Love your neighbor. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we, than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. All right? So, loving your, your neighbor. The Bible does say to love your neighbor. Um, well, you know, some of us, we have neighbors that are enemies. <laughs> some of us, uh, yeah, I get along with my neighbors pretty good here. But um, I don't care how bad a neighbor is. Um, I have ones in the area that I'm not very fond of. Uh, if I ever see any bad guys coming, Black Lives Matter or some other terrorist organization comes to the area here and they're attacking them, I'm going to defend them. Okay? Um, I'm going to fight for them. There are no neighbors in this area, around me, anywhere, the, within the sound, well, not sound of my voice, but within any distance around here. Not one of my neighbors, I will let them just be killed or whatever else, and I'll just stand there and watch it or get out my you know, camera or something. You know, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to fight for them. Why? Uh, probably because the uh, New Testament told me to. Um, love my enemies? Doesn't say that, but it does say love your neighbor. It's an important thing there. Okay. Ephesians chapter 6. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. You know, and I just have to say this, brethren. I hope that you people are reading along in your Bible. I know that some of you listen to me when you're going to work or doing whatever. You're just hearing the audio or you play the video on your phone or whatever else and you're listening to what I'm saying. That's good. But brethren, make sure you take time to read the Bible for yourself. Um, I try to, as hard as I can to read this, you know, the scriptures as they are. But there are times I, I mess up and I don't say it quite right or whatever else. Always go back to the Bible. Please always do that. Make sure to check out everything I'm saying to you. Don't just listen and, oh, man, I love his sermons and I like it. You know, he's funny and entertaining or whatever else. Read the Bible. Don't ever forget, this is your final authority. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Um, I want you to think about that. Who are the real rulers, rulers of this world? Who's the true leader of America? Not Joe Biden here in uh, you know, January of 2024. It's not Joe Biden. You say, well, Donald Trump. It's the, the, you know, they're running the thing from behind the scenes and whatever else. And they're going to, you know, put Joe Biden in prison and, and Hillary Clinton too or something. No, no. Uh, the Jesuits. The Jesuits are running America. They're getting closer, but uh, no. Cardinal Timothy Dolan. No, no. Um, they're not flesh and blood. The rulers of, this, of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And you know, it's kind of weird because I'm starting to see a lot of the politicians are acting like they're uh, satanic masters. They're coming out with things that are doctrines of devils, literally speaking devils up there, starting to resemble more their uh, masters. Maybe eventually it'll be the you know, spiritual wickedness in high places actually running things and physically manifesting. You never know. Um, verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. I wonder what the evil day is. I wonder if we're there yet. 
Uh, you th say, well, I, probably we are. Well, might get a lot worse in the future. But um, what happens if it does? What happens if all of a sudden the spiritual wickedness becomes sight? And now it's no more, more just uh, people up there. What if they're actual devils eventually? And we say, I think the evil day just got here. I mean, can you imagine how many professing Christians would just drop the faith and run and scream if they actually had, if they actually were able to see spiritual wickedness in high places, if they could actually see it? That's a thought. You know, let me get out my, uh, yeah, my, uh, I'll get out my Catholic Youth Bible. Uh, uh, uh. My Sword of the Spirit. E, you know, it's rainbow collared. You know, that's going to help you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Oh, the Bible version issue doesn't matter, brother. It's all up to somebody's interpretation. Let me get that stupid thing back in there. <laughs> uh, it's all somebody's interpretation. You don't need that. This old black book is so offensive and I mean, come on here. The pages are all stained on the side there. It doesn't look very good anymore. It's all from you preaching in it, you know, from it for years and years. And, you know, there's there's duct tape in the inside cover. I mean, look at duct tape. What kind of... Uh-huh. This book has been with me in a lot of battles. It's been a good sword over the years. And uh, a bunch of devils manifest themselves. This is the book I'm going to go for. You think I'm going to be reaching for one of these to fight devils? No. <laughs> or one of those down there. <laughs> New versions. I have the message remix. <laughs> Back. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You better have the right copy. It does matter. And having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You know, I was thinking about that again, and I thought, you know, it's kind of funny how that uh, modern professing Christians, you know, they have these, you know, it's just this life enhancement, you know, just how to overcome life's temptations through Jesus and how to be, a, you know, popular with your friends and how to witness to your friends with Jesus and, and all this other stuff and, you know, I mean, and you just look at it and these people are just so foreign to what the Bible you know, says about what a Christian is supposed to look like and act like and whatever else. And I used to be one. So that's why I have a, you know, kind of an inside knowledge here. I'm not former Illuminati or former Jesuit or something. I'm a former you know, modern Christian. So and just to clarify, I say I'm not a former Jesuit. That doesn't mean I'm a current Jesuit. Some people try to say that about me because they're desperate and have no other way to attack this ministry. I'm not a Jesuit. Okay. My wife was raised around some of that stuff and things. Family members involved in it, but uh, she's not in that anymore. She's saved now. Okay. That's what happens when you get born again. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Some people don't understand that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Um, we'll see some more things here about our attitude towards the lost world. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, it's all saying about the same being there, it's not three different persons, direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, toward all men. So it starts out there, it says, toward uh, one another, there, one toward another, say it that way, talking about saved people, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So 
there is supposed to be love that comes out from us. We're supposed to be different than the lost world. Abhor that which is evil, certainly, but always be ready to make to say, okay, you know what? You see some pervert or whatever else, some weird rainbow-haired thing that doesn't know what they are, try to get the gospel to them, right? Um, again, I'm not saying that's, you know, it's a call to arms, let's go and let's start, you know, go down, march through the streets and kill everybody that doesn't agree with us. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. Please don't ever think that. I'm saying civil war, when you get to this point of division in a nation, civil war is inevitable. I'm just saying it from a historical perspective you know, perspective. It's historical and it's prophetic. It's going to happen, right? Uh, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. That's what Jesus Christ said. That's what I'm saying about that whole thing. But be always ready to show love towards somebody. There are people out there that are genuinely confused. They are not, they have not hardened their hearts. They've never heard the true gospel of Jesus Christ. They've never heard that God created them the way that they originally were for a purpose. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God created you to be a very special person. And you present that to them and you say, and Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. You don't have to go to hell when you die. Always be ready to have that love for them. But if they spit in your face and whatever else, you say, okay, fine. And you walk away. And if they threaten your life, well, at that point in time, you might have to take care of that situation if, they're, if it's a life-threatening situation. Again, the Bible's not against personal defense. Second Timothy chapter 1. Let's go there next. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Um, very important thing there. Uh, if you live in fear out there of... All the stuff that the news media tries to make you be afraid of. Um, other countries and uh, invading America and all the other bad things and stuff that goes through the air that can make you sick, you know what I mean? And uh, living in fear. It will breed, um, the verse says there, power, love, and a sound mind. Well, if you live in fear, you'll have weakness um, and hatred and an insane mind, right? As a Christian, you're not supposed to have those things. We're supposed to uh, walk in love and say, God's not given me a spirit of fear. The only thing I fear is God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So I'm not going to be afraid of this situation. Oh, no, look at this bad things coming and all these horrible things. Yeah, whatever. Power, love, and a sound mind. That's what I'm going to have. Um, and if you show that, everybody else is screaming and running for cover and all the sky's falling and the whole deal and you're just going... No. <laughs> you know, oh, the earth has warmed up a half degree. Oh, we're all going to die. You're... <laughs> Not worried about it. Kim Jong-un has his nuclear weapons pointed at us. Nah. Okay. You know, not a big deal. Um, well, he, he could kill us all. Nah, probably not. Um, you're to have power and love and a sound mind. Because God's not giving you a spirit of fear. And if you start to be afraid of the things of men, it's because you're getting away from the Lord. Just that simple. Finally, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, again there, among the brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good, let him seek peace and ensue it. Again, compare this to what... Paul wrote earlier there in the book of Romans, chapter 12 and chapter 13. Verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? And again, remember, 
Well, see, if we're good people, if we're loving, if we're kind and whatever, then we'll just get along with the world. That's not what he's saying here. Remember, Peter was executed. Right? They killed him. And according to tradition, it doesn't say it in the scriptures, but according to tra tradition, Peter was crucified upside down on a cross. Terrible way to die. So it's not that, uh, who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? So we just kind of, we're passive and we just kind of get along with people and everybody loves us. That's not what Bible-believing Christianity is all about. All right, verse 14. But if, but if And if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Why would you do that? Because you have love for them. Be always ready to give an answer. Uh, there are people out there that are just going to come after you and tick you off and whatever, and the answer is just going to be, you're going to hell. You just There's no other way to be kind to them or whatever else. You have to be rough with them. Don't compromise, you know, to and dialogue or all this other stuff. Don't do that. It's, you have to be blunt with people. But there are other people. Try to start out with charity. Try to show love. Verse 16. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. All right? Um, Jesus Christ died for sinners. Um, he is the just. We are the unjust. And there are people out there that if they can understand that, then they can get saved. Um, and that's why you approach the thing with love, with compassion, power, love, and a sound mind. That's what you do. And as things fall apart, again, devils manifest themselves or something like this. Uh, there's people trying to say that there's some kind of thing down in Miami. There was some uh, mall and these Nephilim were showing up or whatever. It's so blurry you can't even see what the thing is. But that kind of stuff could start happening, you know, in reality. And you might actually have some devils manifesting publicly. And you know what? They're going to look to you. If you're a Christian, your neighbors are going to look to you because they, you know, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but those people there, they have a lot to be afraid of. They have no idea what, a, I mean, what, how would a lost person handle some devil out there? If a devil manifested itself and they have a gun and they pull the gun out and they're shooting the gun at it and the devil just goes, you know, whatever, I'm going to still come towards you, you know, how would they handle that? They have no ability to fight against that. So all of a sudden, they're going to start to look for real Christians. Hmm. And if you love your neighbor, you see, uh, then you'll be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you. Why is it that you have this power? Why is it that you have this hope? You're different than those others. Because brethren, I'm going to tell you, a word of prophecy. Sure word of prophecy here because it's in the scriptures. Again, when I say I'll give you a sure word of prophecy, it's because it's backed up here. Not because all of a sudden, ah, oh, this, you know, angel like, oh, you know, and it comes down and I, oh, yes, I'll tell them. No, it's in the scriptures. Okay? When judgment comes, it begins at the house of God. Okay? That's scripture. In the end times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Huh. Um, what if that actually means a physical, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils? The time is going to come, here's the prophecy, that most people that call themselves Christians right now will drop their faith. I can promise that this positive, practical Christianity that you just don't dare miss and, oh, we're such good people and we do such nice works for people and we have such a beautiful church building. You should come and visit. Whew, it's going to be gone when things get really rough. People won't hold on to that stuff because being a Christian in the future is going to mean something. And quite frankly, probably for a lot of people, it's going to mean that they'll die. <laughs> Doesn't look too good for me if you look at it from a worldly standpoint, 
But if you look at it from the, the uh, standpoint of a, a martyr, well, whatever God's will is, I'm prepared to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have to strap a bunch of you know TNT to myself and go blow something up. That's Islam. Stupid satanic cult that that is. Uh, no, what I'm saying is um, I'm prepared to die for Jesus Christ if the wicked people overtake me and say, let's get him. I've not been given a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. All these professing Christians and things, let's get that heretic, Denlinger. Let's, let's uh, tie him to a stake and put his Godhead doctrine book all around him, that heret heretical book. I already showed a video. Somebody burned my book on uh, Amazon.com. Don't tell me that they'll burn my book, but they won't burn me. Uh, they're looking forward to it. Well, maybe you should back off, Brother Brian. Not happening. Not happening. Because someday I'm going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, and I don't want him to say, you're a coward. Whatever it costs me. I already made that decision years ago. And uh, I'm not backing down. And I'll move forward. Lose friends, lose family, lose whatever. Okay. <laughs> uh, so final points to make. I have a few written down here in my notes. Number one, Christians are told to love their neighbors, not their enemies. Okay. Now you can say my neighbor's my enemy. and <laughs> Okay, I get it. But, uh, uh, you know, say it this way. Help your neighbor, not a burglar or invading army. Right? A burglar breaking into your neighbor's house. Well, he's now my in my neighbor's house. So technically, doesn't that make him my neighbor? <laughs> no. Um, number two, point number two. Self-defense is good and protects your innocent neighbor. All right? I'll tell you a real quick story here. Um, many years ago, when I was living at the house where I grew up, Peach Lane in Ronks, Pennsylvania, Lancaster County, um, and we had neighbors. Our lane went up like this, and there was neighbors right across the road. They were last name was Shutskys, and Polish, you know. And um, so they were across the the road from us. Our lane went out like this. And their house was here, but their driveway was down the road a little bit. And the one night, my father gets a call from one of the daughters, and she says, "Mr. Denlinger," she said, um, "I think there's somebody outside. My parents aren't here. Could you please help me?" And my father said, "No, I'm not doing it for one. no." He said, we'll be right up. And he yelled upstairs to me and he said, Brian, get your shotgun. Come on. Okay. And I grabbed my shotgun and, you know, loading it, coming down the hallway. And and uh, he, I said, what's going on? He said, uh, some intruder up there at the Shutsky's place. We need to get up there right away. Oh, okay. So he had his shotgun. I had my shotgun. We drove up, pulled in the lane. I don't know if the guy took off when he saw us coming or not or whatever, but he said, okay, let's go around the house meet here, you know, make sure that we're going to meet on this corner. Don't shoot me and I won't shoot you. And, and uh, we did it. And I mean, that's the way I was raised. It wasn't some kind of tactical training. Have you go th through the, t we just protected our neighbors. We took care of each other and um, there was no problem. And uh, we searched the, around their property and things. Okay. There's nobody here, whatever else, no guys hiding or anything. And, uh, and I was prepared to shoot, by the way. If some nut would have been there and he had come at me with a knife or something, I would have shot him. He was a teenager. you know. But uh, there wasn't anything there, so my father went up to the door, knocked on the door, and said, yeah, we checked everything. And she said, well, thank you. you know. But I, I heard somebody outside. No question about it. But uh, that's an example of loving your neighbor that you wouldn't think of. Most pacifists would say, oh, well, you know, let's not do that. you know. But uh, that was true love helping a neighbor like that. And I would help my, any of my neighbors in town here like that or uh, my actual property where I live. Point number three that I want to make. Christians are mostly instructed to love their saved brethren. All right, um, Lost people love to take advantage of gullible Christians and that's something you have to be very careful of. Um, there was a scam going around um, back when I was living down in Pennsylvania many years ago. And there, were, there was a couple that was going around to church buildings and they were asking for help and we have financial troubles and all this stuff. It was all a scam. They were just scamming people for their money, gullible Christians. So if you're going to help somebody, um, financially especially in the future, you really better be very careful. You know, you better make sure that they're legitimate and they're telling the truth and, and things. Um, in other words, I'm saying somebody that's professing Christian. Um, 
be real careful about that. Point number four, Christians should be politically active in their local area. Why? Because it's a good way to show love for your neighbors. Um, that's why I'm doing, you know, fighting against this whole Wolfton thing, because I have neighbors that are for it and some that are very much against it and some that are saying it's going to ruin our way of life. And it would if these, you know, Wolfton people come. And uh, from what I understand, one of you, one of our viewers, a uh, friend of the ministry, sent me an article and said um, the, about how that uh, the Land Use Planning Commission are going to put off the decision until February sometime, probably, you know, there's a news article about it. Um, which I don't like. I, I'm afraid of what they're going to do. This whole Wolfton thing, they're trying to mine up just to the north of us a few miles from my property. And uh, it's a very, um, not a very reputable company that wants to come in. The president, I put out the videos showing that he said we can do it cheap as chips and we can do it you know, quick and dirty and all this other stuff. They're going to pollute the area is what they want to do. And it would basically ruin my property and you know poison the aquifer underneath my land and the spring water that we you know, live on um, would be poisonous. So real nice thing to do there. But uh, I think what they're going to try, probably try to do is they'll probably come out and say, well, um, we're going to give Wolfton permission if they can say where the tailings facility is. In other words, where they'll put all the toxic waste from the mining operation. Because right now they're not saying anything about where that's going to be. So if they can bring that out, then, oh, we'll give them permission then. Um, it, probably money involved, a little bit of Masonic stuff probably as well. Lord only knows. But uh, number five, point number five, if your neighborhood is bad, then move to a good one. You say, brother, I can't, you know, love any of my neighbors because they're all rotten, drug dealing, prostitutes and whatever else. Then move to a new one, move to a new area. And, um, you know, and I'll say this too in my notes here, Christians should improve an area. We should go to an area and things should get better there. And if things are getting worse, well, then the Lord could be saying to you, um, you need to leave the area. Again, you know, read the book of Acts, brethren. Christians moved all the time. So um, hopefully that video, or hopefully this sermon has been a blessing to you. I've been wanting to get to it, but uh, had some sickness. Uh, Oliver got a little bit chilled the one day and he got a cold and then I... Uh, you know, just being around him and everything else, um, trying to take care of him. I ended up getting the cold and uh, really hit it with a lot of natural health type of stuff. So it, it didn't last very long, but it was just kind of, you know, the thing is you have to take care of this thing. And, and so, and then my wife had a little tiny bit, but, you know, the whole point is I had some sickness that we were struggling with. And, um, but thankfully over that now, so I was able to finally get this study done. Um, always something to do in the ministry. But um, thank you to everybody out there for your prayers. We do really appreciate that. And, of course, your support for the ministry. Um, I have some big projects that I'm going to be working on, uh, some different things I need to get done. I'm not going to go into big detail right now, but uh, some big things I want to get done. I'm doing some research. Um, <laughs> I'll just give you a little hint. Uh, it's going to deal with masonry, Freemasonry. And I watched a Masonic ritual today. It was two and a half hours long. <laughs> uh, enduring to the end of that, believe me. Um, but I literally felt sick in my stomach after I watched it. And it wasn't any kind of blood stuff or weird. It's just the normal rituals that they do. Uh, Blue Lodge Freemasonry type of thing. Uh, Master Mason degree. But... Oh, just my soul is so vexed when I got done. I literally just felt sick and I was getting my office ready to go here and getting my notes ready and some other things I need to do and just kind of thinking, oh, I hope I feel better by the time I'm ready to preach. So sorry if I was a little bit off there, but um, now you know why. So that is going to be it. I'm going to be doing some other videos here today. So I'll be ending this one now. So that will be it. Thank you very much for watching. See you in upcoming videos. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17-18. through 18. 
If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.